King Jesus, long as I've got King Jesus, long, long, long as I've got him, don't need nobody else. I've been lied on, lied on cheated, 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 talked about, talked mistreated, about, mistreated, mistreated rebuked, rebuked, scorned, scorned, talked about your sure sure been up, up, up down, down, almost to almost the ground, to the but long as I've got King Jesus, long as I've got King Jesus, long, long as I've got him, don't need nobody else. I don't, don't need nobody, nobody else. else. Doctor, doctor, lawyer, lawyer preacher, preacher, teacher, teacher. Long as I've got King Jesus, long as I've got King Jesus, long, long, long as I've got him, don't need nobody else. I don't need nobody else. I don't need nobody else. No mother, father, sister, brother, no doctor, lawyer. Preacher, preacher, teacher, teacher. Long as I've got King Jesus, long as I've got King Jesus, long, long as I've got him, don't need nobody else. Do you know what I mean? I've been lied on, cheated, talked about, mistreated, rebuked, scorned, talked about, sure as you're born. I've been up, down, almost to the ground, but long, long. Long as I've got King Jesus, Jesus. long as I've got King Jesus, Jesus. I know he's a burden bearer, I know he's a heavy load sharer, he'll be the bridge of a water, he'll be your doctor and your lawyer, he'll be a friend when you're friendless, he'll be your mother when you're motherless, he'll be the bread when you're hungry, he'll be a comfort when you're lonely, long as I've got King Jesus, long as I've got King Jesus. Jesus, I got him. Jesus, I got him. Jesus, he's a lily of the valley and the bright morning star. He's the sweet rose of Sharon and the great I am. Long as I've got King Jesus, long as I've got King Jesus, long, long, long as I've got him, don't need nobody else. Tomb locked that 
day the stone that sealed it would be rolled away. Hallelujah. Since the battle has been won, since the
to fight my battles alone With thoughts of this world creeping And my heart is left wanting again Then I fall on my knees With my face to the ground And I pray that your healing hand would come down We've all been there in that desperation to have God lay his hand on us once again, to surrender it all once again. We've all been there. And it's okay as long as you're surrendering it. It's all right to be there. Just let it go. Amen. Let's give our pastor a good hand as he comes. I want to say this one more time. How many of you understand all during the conference and all the different ways they've had to work together and labor together to make this a success. How many of you appreciate a praise team that has that dedication, that kind of commitment? Let's let them know we love them this morning. God bless you so very, very much. Amen. Look at somebody and tell them everything is going to be all right. Even that. Amen. Amen. You may be seated if you like this morning. This has been a 
very, very busy week. It's been a time of a lot of changes, a lot of excitement because God is right now opening the doors to a new beginning for many areas of the ministry. And uh, there's times that we, we don't know step by step what the next is going to be. But when God begins to give you long-term vision, he knows that there's a vision for you that's going to last and last and last. So this week we went down and signed the papers to uh, make the commitment. And now Spirit of Truth becomes the owner of the property next door. So, <laughs> so we have to work on that. I know you're happy about it. And uh, a little bit later we'll help you pay for it. We're so very, very blessed. We'll give you a little more information a little bit later. But I, I'm amazed that the Spirit of the Lord, I don't know how many last Sunday morning heard the vision that started with the price was sharing about the joy they had to be a part of this ministry and the new beginnings. And then I looked around and realized they started making commitments and it just, there's something happened last Sunday morning. Everybody got excited. Yeah. I haven't realized that there's something about enthusiasm. There's something about a new beginning. There's something about God making a promise. How many of God tells you what he's going to do for you 10 years from now? That means you get to live. Yeah. Amen. So God's got great things in store. We also had the, the, all the platform ripped out of the Springfield Church. It, it's looking wonderful <laughs> by faith. But uh, put it back together. We'll be having service tonight. And what it tells me is that there's a bright tomorrow for us. God's got great things in store. So in every area of the ministry, there's changes taking place, and I'm excited about it. I was praying this week about uh, all the great things that God did. I want God to seal the promises of the, uh, the conference into the lives of everybody that heard. How many know it's not enough to be here about what God wants to do? We have to be doers of the word. We have to be willing to apply it to our life. And so the Lord's been speaking to my life. It's time for us to raise our hands. Everybody say, lift your hands. How many of you, anybody ever get mad and raise your hand? Anybody ever fall in love and raise your, both, both arms and your hands? There's something that takes place that, that like never before, when God begins to activate something inside of you to do something for him, there, there's just something that has to happen. We say, well, I believe and, I, and I've got great plans, but until you make a step, nothing has changed. And right now, God is starting to move our hands and reach out and bless other people. And, and I know that somebody says, well, I'm not great. I'm not good. Well, we had a number of our ministries here from all over America and uh, some that could not, many that could not come this year. But it was amazing to watch that we are all a family. But I noticed if every one of the ministries don't function, there's not much of a ministry. How many of you realize everybody has some kind of ministry on the inside? Some are out of the spotlight and others never will be, but that's okay. We're a part of the body. And we can't function in the spotlight if we don't have the people that help us in the dark. Am I right? Often, let you imagine this. I, I, I never, hardly ever thank God for my, my kidneys and thank Him for my liver. But how many know without it, I'm dead? And so those unseen parts of the body are just as valuable as those that are out in front. And I'm very thankful for every one of you that are a part of the body of Christ. That God has great things in store. I'd like you to go, if you will, back to the book of Exodus, the second chapter. It's, it's such an amazing analogy of what God is doing right now. And, and I'm excited because I'm, I'm willing. Anybody willing to work? Uh, Brother Keen is putting in the platform, tearing out all the, the stuff in the Springfield Church. And Brother Price and I went down to, you know, help load up all the stuff that he had tore up. And come to find out, we had helpers that came along, and they wanted to do that. And Brother Price was all ready for work. It kind of shocked Brother Keen. He said, I thought he was just going to jump in the middle of the pile and just do all the work for us. But how many know sometimes we need helpers? Anybody ever need a helper? Anybody ever fall down and need somebody to pick you up? Anybody ever spiritually fall down and need somebody to help pick you up? Amen. How many of you have ever been the one that was the picker-upper and not the faller-downer? Just because you're the one picking up now doesn't mean there has not been a time that you were the one that needed the help. And so in this scripture, I want you to get this because we're going to deal a little bit with, with Moses, but we're going to deal with us today. We're going to talk about a qualified for ministry and the handiwork that God has placed in our spirit. Uh, over the last several weeks, our ministers came, and some of them, especially I remember one of the words that Brother uh, Pastor Steve Miller from Springfield, Illinois, gave to us when we were in conference. He said, Pastor, I, I want to remind you that if you had not imparted it to us, we would not be doing what we're doing. And all the ministries that are a part of that would not be functioning in the way that they are if somebody hadn't reached out a helping hand. Sometimes it doesn't seem like you're doing a lot, but I know sometimes that's a lifeline. There's been people that came by and blessed me when they didn't even know I needed the blessing desperately, but they, they brought a, a time to spare me, to help me through a very difficult time. Kathy, and I often talk about Brother Edley, he came by 
nearly 30 years ago, and, and he stopped by a service, and he just walked over and handed us a $100 bill. He didn't know us. But how many know sometimes that means food on the table? Sometimes that means keeping the lights on. Sometimes it's very significant. And, and I would rather be the giver than the receiver. Amen. It's better to give than to have to receive. Amen. How many of you are glad that now that you come to the place where you're able to give, you're not tight? Everybody say that's a spiritual word called tight. In the second uh, chapter of Exodus, I won't read all the story, but we realize there's a, a boy named Moses. He spared when all uh, many of the Israelite children are being thrown into the Nile River, thrown to the crocodiles and killed. Pharaoh commanded all the midwives that when you see a Hebrew uh, mother having a baby, go in and make sure you kill the baby. We don't want them to survive. Well, God gave Moses' mother wisdom and knowledge, and she was able to hide her baby uh, for a season. When he got a little bit older and he started crying too late and too loud and he was not able to be hid any longer, the Bible said they took him down and put him in an ark of bulrushes and put him in the Nile River. It wasn't happen chance. It was the fact that Pharaoh's daughter was down for the bathing, her ceremonial cleansing in the Nile River because they believed it was like a god. The Nile River was a god. Life came forth, so it was a god. And while she's bathing, she recognizes that there's a little ark that's there in that water. And when she sends her servant to go look inside the ark, the little baby Moses started crying and she fell in love with the baby Moses that was her arch rival and enemy, but she didn't know that he was going to deliver God's people out of her father's hand. How many of God works in mysterious ways? We don't hear a lot about Moses. History says that he became a great warrior. He became a great soldier, captain of army. He conquered many areas, brought, brought great victory. But we don't hear anything about Moses from the time he was in the Nile. And as he's growing up until the second chapter tells us that one day, he watched the Israelites, knowing that he was an Israelite, and he watched one of his brothers being treated bad, and, and so he intervened, and the Bible said he slew the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. The first account, encounter we have with Moses doing anything, he used his hands in the wrong way. I don't think anybody in this house has ever killed anybody. If you have, please don't tell it. We don't want to know right now. But the first thing that God lets us know about his called out chosen Moses was a man that was going to deliver the people. But the first thing we know about him is he used his hands wrong. He used his hands to kill and to cover up. I don't think anybody in this room is exempt from having to try to cover up something that you did that you did not want anybody to know about. Can I just kind of grin at me? Don't, don't raise your hand. It might be self-incriminating. And so the Bible said the next day when he goes out among his people, they, they look at him and they say, what are you going to do, kill us like you killed that man? How many people are always watching you when you don't know it? And when Moses realized that he was, he was caught, he took his flight into the desert. And though he is only 40 years old, when he leaves Egypt, he leaves completely from everything that he was familiar with, and he leaves into a desert place for 40 long years. Here's a man that the last thing we know about him is he's killed someone with his hands and now we hear nothing about him, but he becomes a shepherd, if you will. Forty years are gone before God calls him to be used for his glory. I want you to get a hold of this because if you want to read more about it, you look in, in the second chapter, it tells you about that horrible thing that he did. But in the third chapter, the Lord is calling to Moses and out of a burning bush and he is saying, I'm going to call you and I'm going to send you now into the land of Egypt and you're going to speak to Pharaoh. And he is going to set the people free because I'm going to be with you. In other words, your hands are dirty now, but I'm going to clean your hands. Lord, aren't you glad that God knows how to clean the mud and the dirt off of your hands and you can use your hands again to be a blessing? And I love this story because Moses is a stammering person. He, he sort of stutters a little bit. He, he's not good at speaking. He's not eloquent. So he, he tells God, I'm not good at, you know, God already knows everything you're going to tell him about yourself. And he knows all the honest details that we don't often pray about. And so God's will you have a brother that can talk like a magpie, take him along with you, and he'll do the talk, and you just tell him what to say. How many realize even if God tells you to tell someone else what to do, it's still God talking, not you? That was real good right there. How many prophecy when it's real, it's God talking, not you? So if God's not talking, don't say anything. Or if you do, blame yourself that it was your idea. I'm helping somebody here. So the Bible said God told him, he said, I'm going to stretch out my hand. Would somebody say God's hand? I'm going to smite Egypt with all of my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. I love this because God tells Moses, I'm going to use you. But he doesn't give him an army. He doesn't give him weapons. All Moses had in his hand was a staff. I said, why did he need that? He's 80 years old. He needs something to help him walk. Everybody say he needed a crutch. 
And I know that was to help with the sheep. I understand all that. But the symbol is, he said, I am going to let you have a rod or a staff in your hand. I know this is spiritual teaching, but let me give it to you. The rod doesn't represent a staff so he can get the wolves out of the way. It's not a staff that just helps you to stand erect when you're weak at times and weary. But the rod represents the ministry of the Lord that is in your hand. How many of you have the ministry of the Lord in your hand? Oh, God, help me to say it. How many of you realize I could do nothing without the ministry in my hand? I've been to hospitals all over America, laid hands on sick and dying people. But I realize if the rod of ministry was not in my hand, or if the Lord was not on the inside doing the praying, I am doing nothing at all but wasting up both of our time. But aren't you glad that you have Christ in you, the hope of glory? You have the hand of God on Help me, Father. Everybody say, I have the hand of the Lord. So fast forwarding to the, the seventh chapter, I'm going to give you homework and we'll read this. Otherwise, we'll be here until all the Presbyterians and Methodists are already out of the restaurant and ready for their second meal. Seventh chapter, God said to Moses, say this to Aaron, take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh and it shall become a serpent. Kind of amazing that all the symbolism that we don't really understand until we get over the New Testament, but it makes a lot of sense for the Bible scholars when Aaron, his, his helper, his brother, Begins to take the rod that's in his hand or the ministry that's in his hand. And he just, God said, take what's in your hand and throw it down on the ground. And do it right in front of the man that's the most important man on earth. In other words, scare the fire out of Pharaoh. If you got a rod and you throw it down in front of me and it's a snake. I'm probably going to be visiting next door real quick. Amen. There's an old friend of mine in Hollywood at, he worked with uh, Step and Fetch it. Some of you won't know who that is, but Stepan was always afraid of everything, and, and they would scare him, and he said, I don't know about you, but in 11 seconds, I'm going to be five miles from here. <laughs> but I want you to hear this. God said, Aaron, Moses said, Aaron, take the stick. This is my stick. This represents the presence of God. Throw it on the ground right at Pharaoh's feet. And when he did, it became a snake. Does anybody believe that? Yeah. Somebody said, oh, he was high, and it looked like a snake. No, it was a serpent. And so in time, after he finally gets to the opportunity to do that, he throws his rod at the feet of Pharaoh. Everybody say, he did that. Yeah. Verse 17, thus saith the Lord, and this shall you know that I'm the Lord. Because of what I'm going to do, you're going to know that I'm real. I'm going to smite with the rod that which is in my hand upon the waters that are uh, in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. The fish of the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink of the water of the river. The Lord spake to Moses, said to, uh, say to Aaron, take thy rod and stretch out thy hand upon the waters of Egypt and upon their streams and upon the rivers and upon their ponds and upon their pools of water, that they may become blood, that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and vessels of stone. Everything that we're studying right now is significant because when you stretch out your hand, something changes. When you stretch out your hand, something significant takes place. We, we discovered at the beginning of the year, one of the most amazing things God spoke to me to speak to you was when people get serious in the Bible, that's when something happens. Almost every miracle in the Bible happened when somebody got serious. Nothing takes place when you don't move. Nothing takes place until you act. It's called an act of faith. It means something stimulated you to do something. And it's not the great thing you decided to do. It's the fact that God honors your action of faith and he begins to move. Every miracle happens because somebody gets involved. Can I get an amen? amen. Now, if I can just digress back to the serpent before Pharaoh. What happened was when the, 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 the serpent began to slither across the floor in front of the Pharaoh, he got his magicians and soothsayers and his fake miracle workers and and they all threw their serpent their, their stick on the ground and they became snakes they were uh, you know it was all trickery but it, it happened and the thing i like about it when all those other serpents are slithering around moses serpent which represents jesus moses serpent swallows up all the other serpents i don't think i've very often seen a snake eat a snake look at your neighbor telling my snake's bigger than your snake how many of you don't like snakes? Okay. Some of you don't even like roaches. Give me an amen right here. <laughs> and so after the serpent swallows all of Pharaoh's soothsayer's serpents, God said, now tell him to take it up. I, I know he didn't take it by the head. He took it by the tail because ain't nobody that brave. And as soon as he picked it up, it became a rod again. Anybody believe that? 
How many like to have that power to walk around with your stick downtown courthouse and just throw it down to scare people? <laughs> You'd have to even have a rod to hold up the bank. Just say, here, here's my snake. If you want me to get rid of him, give me your money. Does anybody believe the story? And Pharaoh still had a hard heart, so God has to go through all of the ten plagues. All of the ten plagues that came in Egypt happened when God told Moses to move your hand. Everybody say, a little bit of action caused a change over all the land of Egypt. How many realize if you'll start moving your hand in faith, it'll change your family, it'll change your health, it'll change your stratosphere, it'll change your ionosphere. I'm making up words right now because some of you are not giving me an amen. How many of you realize when you begin to move, when God says move, then God is in charge. And what God has in his hand works in your hand because you're willing to connect hands with God. I'm going to say it this morning. It's time to raise your hands and let God get glory out of your life. It's time for you to raise your hands and bring victory to the lives of those around you. There is not a bondage too big. There is not an addiction too strong. There is not a perversion that's too wild. That God cannot change it if we'll begin to lift our hands to a God that has the power in heaven and earth to bring change upon humanity. But somebody say, I'm ready for this ministry. Now, we understand that that rod that was a serpent, it's not that God's into snakes. But how many of you remember when Eve listened to the devil the first time that caused all of us to live in the pain and the suffering that we're in? It's because of the serpent that spoke to the woman. She yielded and told her husband, and Adam yielded, and now we all have trouble. But how many of you realize that serpent had to be subservient to the next symbolic servant called Jesus? If you go to the doctor, and usually there's a little symbol on the outside of the doctor's office, and, and what is it usually? It's, a, it's like a cross with a snake. Does that mean when you go inside, they're going to have a snake? Or does it mean like Jesus that became our sickness, our sin, sacrifice on the pole? Not on a pole like Moses, but on a pole called a cross that when he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. So the Lord is saying, and I want to make it brief this morning, you still have access to the one that became your sickness. He became your sin sacrifice. And... The Bible said that Israel got mad at God's servant Moses and they complained and so God sent fiery serpents and, and they began to sting and bite and devour the Israelites and they were dropping like flies. But all of a sudden they said, we've sinned against God. Pray to God. Move your hand toward God and let God's hand move these snakes away from us. So God told Moses, use your hands and make a serpent out of brass. Put it up on a pole. I don't know how long it would take me to make a brass serpent, but... They're going to get stung for a while because I'm not quick. i got to melt down some metal and I have to fabricate a... Are you still here? They're probably saying, don't make it pretty, Moses. Just get that thing on the pole. We're losing our family. The Bible said everybody looks at that serpent on the pole. Everyone that beholds it will live. If you look at the cross today, you'll live. I don't care how sick you are with sin. I don't care how bound you are and what you've done. If you can see him high and lifted up, he will save you and heal you and deliver you. Would somebody say it's just a symbol? Just an ugly looking old snake on a pole. But it wasn't about the serpent on the pole. Somebody said, why brass? Brass is a symbol of judgment. How many realize the blood of Jesus Christ covers all the judgment that is against your life? Anybody getting this? And I started looking and my mind began to go rapidly through so many areas. I thought, God, this is what it's all about. But somebody's got to move their hand. Somebody has to lift their hand to the Lord. Isn't it amazing all through scripture when men begin to lift their hand or reach out to the sick and the bound, the depressed and the troubled, that God always intervened for their life. Nothing ever happens until you move. You want things to change? Do something. Somebody said, well, maybe it's wrong. Well, you learn from the wrong and then you'll finally do something right. Anybody ever done anything wrong? I rest my case, and I win. The Bible said that when Moses got the rod, he wrapped that brazen serpent around it and everybody that could see it. Some about to die in their delirium were looking through their bloodshot eyes, if you will, and through their tears of fear. But as soon as they saw the serpent, life came back. Why did the Lord do that? Why did God use the serpent on the floor of Pharaoh to swallow up all the other serpents? Because greater is he that is in you. 
It doesn't matter how many serpents of hell come against you. The serpents of heaven will devour them. It doesn't matter the problem in your life. It doesn't matter what men say about you. The one that loves you the most is the one that you have to worry about whether or not you're pleasing him. I don't need to please anybody. And I found out, and, and I don't want to discourage you this morning. I found out you can't please everybody. Look at your neighbor and tell him, and this is not your day. Maybe tomorrow I'll please you, but today is not, not looking good for you. I've got too many other people to please. Am I right? We understand that this staff has many significances, and a staff doesn't normally move by itself. A rod doesn't function by itself. It is totally in the hand of someone that can do something with it. And the Bible said when Israel came out of Egypt and God delivered two and a half million people in a day. You know, some people, when they come out of sin, they want to bring sin with them. When God brought Israel out of Egypt, nobody brought anything out with them. Boy, there's a message right there. Anybody still fighting some of your past stuff? Anybody still got some Egypt, Egypt dust that you go back and sniff once in a while? <laughs> Look at me. You can't do that if you get far enough from Egypt. Say it. I can't even smell Egypt. I went out Wesley all this morning. I still smell spaghetti. I got hungry looking for some meatballs or something. I said, is there anything left over? But how many realize somebody had to move their hand to feed us? Somebody had to move their hand and move their car to get all the way from across the country to minister to us. Am I right? The working of God is because every one of us have ability to connect. There's probably nothing more precious than having someone come to you and touch you. When you're hurting my father's funeral my mother's funeral people want to say all these wonderful words and i knew they meant to heal me but there's really not a lot you can say over someone that you've just lost and i found the most important thing that ever was done somebody just came up and they touched me let me know they love me i'm here with you it's not what you say I give the story often of a little boy that loved his grandfather and had never seen his grandfather cry until grandma passed away Grandpa's down the porch rocking and crying, and the little boy doesn't know what to do. He's never seen Grandpa like that. So he just crawled up in his lap, and Grandpa said, Son, what are you doing? He said, I'm just here to help you cry. Have you ever needed anybody just to come and help you cry? Or care enough to cry? Just, just be there for you? Starting now, the ministry of Spirit of Truth is going to become even more precious because we're going to start helping each other. We're going to start being there for each other. Well, I'm not the pastor. I can't go to the hospital. I bequeath upon you the authority to go to the hospital. <laughs> I knight you as Lord over hospitals. I'd rather go to the hospital, the jail, the prison. Wherever you want to go, we release you. Anybody know that I'm just one person? I cannot be at ten places at one time. Some people get mad. Well, you need to be here. I can't be five and six places at a time. Amen. I can send the word and pray. Or I can send somebody. Amen. One of the greatest things ever happened to me in that area was in Springfield, the hospital, and the lady said, well, Pastor, you didn't have to come. I know you're busy, but I just, I'm glad you came. I just wanted to see you. How many realize we can send the elders because that's what the Bible says to do? Boy, I wish I'd have got some more amens on that. But you know what? It's really hard to lay hands on folks if you won't move your hand. It's hard to function in the kingdom if you don't lift your hands. Not everybody's, you know, all excited and praise and worship. Some people, they raise their hands and other people just cry. It's okay. But there's something about raising your hands and say, I surrender. If you put a 38 in my back and say, I want your money, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to reach heaven. Take my wallet. Y'all still here? Just leave me alone. Wave your hands and say, amen. <laughs> Am I right? Why do we lift our hands? Because it says, I surrender. If you can surrender to the robber, you ought to be able to surrender to the Lord. Because look at me, he's not trying to kill you. He's trying to get you to praise him so he can live in your praise and fix what's killing you. Anybody think it's about time we spiritually lift our hands? If you never get your hands up out, above your head. Anybody think it's time we start reaching out to God and then reaching out to man? I believe that his ministry, and I'm talking to all of you, you have some area of ministry in your life. Everyone should be able to touch, touch God. Your prayers touch God. How do you know that he hears you every time you pray? So you can pray. And the ones that don't know how to pray, you can reach down and help them until they learn on their own. 
Praying is not hard. It's just talking. Just say it. You don't have to use King James. You don't even have to know, you know, how, how to say it. Thief on the cross prayed the most pitiful prayer of all, but it got him into heaven within the day. How many realize? Just remember me. God knows what you're trying to say. Oh, you can learn pretty prayers. You can buy books full of prayers. But I found out when I read somebody else's prayer, it doesn't have the same effect as when I talk to God. Because he's my father. A few weeks ago, we had a beautiful rainbow out in front of the service. And Brent and I were standing there. And he said, that's a beautiful rainbow. I said, my daddy made that. <laughs> kind of shocked him a little bit. I said, yeah, my, my dad made that. Why are you saying that? It's simple. That's childish. No, until you have that kind of a relationship with God that you understand he loves you and he belongs to you and you belong to him. You won't pray effectively. How many glad God belongs to us? Moses got to the edge of the Red Sea and God said, just stretch out your hand over the sea. What if Moses would have said, that won't work. That don't even make any sense. People call me a religious idiot. Guy standing with his hand out over the water. What a nut. Anybody ever think it's weird when people care what people think about them when they pray? So Moses raised up his hand, and when he did, the water started parting. History says it went about a quarter of a mile up in the air each way. So the people could go hundreds side by side, win abreast to cross, or it would have taken days to get across. And it just sort of stood there like frozen jello. Wait, 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 no, no. How did he do that? Well, he lifted his hand. What if he had said, I, I, that's, that doesn't make sense. I'm not going to do that. Well, they would have all got killed by Pharaoh's army or put back in slavery. Don't ever try to figure out why God tells you to use your hand the way he does. Just do it. Look down and say, my hand. Everything God wants to do in every life around me. Every circumstance I find myself in, the power to bring victory is right here. But if I refuse to move it, God won't use his. He just wants simple acts of faith. Am I right? Raised his hands, the water parted, and all the Israelites walked across. And as soon as the last little child got up out on the other side, God said, okay, now turn around and do that again. You know, by now his faith is probably pretty strong. <laughs> if I went down to Paint Creek and I raised my hand, that water parts, I will have no doubt that when I put my hand up again, it's going to come back together. And those fish laying on the bottom are saying, please, preacher, bring back the water. I'm guessing right now. I don't know what they do here because coming from where they come from at this place behind us, uh, don't eat the fish. <laughs> Does anybody believe that when Moses raised his hand, the water parted? Do you believe that he was special and holy and awesome? Or do you believe that he was a murderer that the Lord decided to change him and fix him? Why does God use him as a murderer? Because that's about as bad as you can get. But God can still use you. See, what you think you did that's all that bad, God says, that's not all that bad. My blood can fix that. But if you believe that, he will, and he has done that, then he's going to start asking you just to move your hand once in a while. Say it. I need to raise my hand to a hurting world. When the water was parted, I, I, I like this. You know, God didn't give Moses an army to fight the Pharaoh's army. He just gave him a hand and a stick. A stick with a snake in it. <laughs> Don't forget that. Just a, just a stick that's got a hidden snake in it. Well, it's a full-bellied snake because he's got all the other snakes in his belly. <laughs> Y'all still here? Didn't even burp. I mean, the, the, the awesome thing. So when the Israelites come across, can you imagine people the size of the campground if it was the size of the state of Rhode Island or on the other side of the Red Sea? And, and God says, Moses, now here's Pharaoh's army and all the armies in the middle of the Red Sea. So what I want you to do to win the biggest victory you've ever won is just raise up your hands. He did that and the water drowned Pharaoh's whole army and he didn't have to move a weapon. That's why God is saying, saints, why don't you just lift your hands and give praise to God for what you want him to do. You've got a wayward child, you've got a financial situation, you've got a problem you can't solve. Just why do we lift our hands? I think what God is saying, just act like you're giving your problem to me. Casting all of your care upon me because I care for you. He makes a way where there seems to be no way.
But somebody say, I, I, I'm more powerful than all this. I don't even really need all this. If you go to Exodus 17, again, we're closing on this one. Hopefully, if not, it's your fault because you amen me down. Chapter 17 of Exodus, the book of leaving, verse number 8. Then Amalek, they fought with Israel in an area called Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, his heir apparent, Choose us out, men. Go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow. And while you're out there fighting, I'm going to stay right here. And I'm going to stand on the top of the hill of the Lord with, with the rod of God in my hand. You know, once you learn the secret of what the hand represents, you'll start using it. Once you realize you've laid hands on folks and God heals them, you won't be afraid to use your hands again. Has anybody ever prayed for someone, just touched them, and something happened? <laughs> Am I right? I give the story often, but I tell the story about uh, Leslie went to the hospital, and she's dying. She, her organs are all shutting down, and they're trying to keep her alive in a bed that is shaking and rocking. And I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, well, I just brought you over here to bring my presence to her. How many know if you don't carry the presence of God, you probably shouldn't go anyway? And so I anointed her with my hand. Was it my hand or was it the presence of God? Come on, just do this a little bit if you can't. Say, I got him in my hand. And wherever I touch, he touches. But if I refuse to touch, I limit somebody. Well, I'm not great. Well, Moses wasn't great either. Did you hear that? Moses wasn't great either. If you listen to this, this is such a heavy thing. There's times that even powerful ministries get too tired to function. Amen. A lot of people don't want you to know that. Even preachers get sick. Amen. Even faith healers get sick. The Bible says whatever happens in the world happens to the body of Christ too. The only difference is we have the Lord to help us. Let me read it so you believe I'm telling the truth. I kind of like Moses, he delegates authority, said, I, I'm going to stand up here on, on the hill while you go down and work. <laughs> I said, he's lazy, no. He knows that the fighting is not going to win the battle. The rod of ministry in the hand of the ministry is what wins the battle. Amen. They got soldiers going to fight physically, but I want you to read this with me. I'm going to stand on the top of the hill. I've got the rod of God. I've got this snake filled rod inside my hand that represents Jesus Christ is with me in my hand. So Joshua did what Moses had said to him, and he fought with Amalek, and Moses and Aaron and Hur went to the top of the hill. And it happened. It came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. When he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Stop. When Moses all day long had his hands up, not one arrow, not one sword killed an Israelite, husband, brother, or son. But as soon as his arm got tired, Amalek started killing family. Anybody ever get tired? Anybody ever get tired of reaching out to people? Fighting other people's battles. The story is very significant and there's such symbolism in it. And, and that's why we're going to close with it so you can take it home and meditate on it. As long as Moses had his hands up, Israel won, hands down, the enemy won. Moses' hands were heavy. Wow, I love that. Been in ministry for 50 years plus, and sometimes our, our hands get heavy. Kathy and I were talking the last couple of weeks have been so intense. It's not just about building and purchasing and buying and working and laboring, but the conference preparation, preparation, Appalachia, preparation, entertainment of all the ministries, all the details of it and, and the work. April's worn out. Tom and Donnie worn out. Everybody's worn out because it's been an intense time. Let me say it this way. Our hands get heavy. The load is heavy on your shoulders. The Bible said that his hands were heavy, so they took a stone. What everybody says, stone represents Christ. They put it under him. He sat there on and Aaron and her stayed up his hands, one on the one side and one on the other. His hands were steady until the going down of the sun. It's really beautiful sometimes when people come alongside and help you. They set Moses down. Can you help me, Tracy? Set him on a rock and Aaron got on one side and her got on the other side. Why? Because they knew when his hands are lifted. I don't lose my son over there in the battle, my nephew. I don't lose my uncle. I don't lose my cousin or grandpa in the battle. But if we let his hands down, if he stops lifting his hands to God, we die. Anybody realize the significance of starting to lift your hands back to God? Amen. The Bible said it happened until the evening. Somebody say the ending of a day and the beginning of a new day. 
I wonder how hard it would be when you raise your hands when you can't do it any longer. Have you ever tried to reach out and see how long you can do it and finally you start shaking and finally after a while you get numb and then you just can't? But you look over and you see an arrow going through a son or a brother or a cousin or a nephew because my hands are down. So Aaron and her said, we got your back. We'll lift your hands. I want to say to somebody in this room, I have your back, but I can't do it by myself. There's been times I've had to come along and say, Trevor, can you help me? Butter, can you help me? Sons, can you help me? How many hear what I'm saying? I'll, I'll come around. Uh, hey, Harold, I need, and, and are you still here? And we realize that what one person can't do, if somebody just lifts your hands, we don't lose. There's nothing that we lose as long as we continue to put our hand in the hand of the one that steals the water, raises the dead, and, and brings life and deliverance. This morning, God is doing something in our heart, and I want you to get a hold of this before you leave the room. I want you to recognize that not only are you called to lift somebody's feeble hands so that their war will be won and their victory will be established, but they're going to come back in a day to come, and they're going to lift up your hands. And when we all are there as lifters and helpers and encouragers, there's nothing we can accomplish because somebody in this room is weak today. Somebody in this, this room needs to hear from God today. Somebody needs a hand laid on your shoulder. Somebody needs somebody to wipe the tears out of your eye or comfort you and give you hope and peace. You have that power, but if you refuse to move your hand, they're going to remain the same. I want everybody to stand, if you will. When we get serious, God begins to move. The Bible said Joshua conquered the battle of Amalek because of two men that were willing to come alongside and help the preacher. It's easy for me to say that because today I am the preacher, but how many realize everybody has a message and everybody around you is getting weary and weak at some time and you need to recognize that and come alongside and lift up their feeble hand. Lift them up when they're going through trouble, when the tears are more than they can bear. Just, you don't physically have to do it, but spiritually you need to lift somebody's hand. The Bible said confirm the feeble knees. In other words, help the people that are about to fall. Lift up the hands that are weak. Encourage one another. Today we need to recognize you and I are called to lift up somebody hand. I may not understand your dilemma perfectly, but I understand that I love you and that God loves you and you need me to be there for you. And I vow today, I will be there if you let me. And I want you to vow that we can fight this battle together. And if I have to, I can call on you. I know we don't like to touch each other sometimes because it's a little dainty and undignified, but would you grab somebody's hand and just lift it up? Wasn't hard, was it? Look at me. What if I was to tell you that as soon as you let that hand down, somebody in their family is going to die? Would that be fair? No. That's why God gives you somebody on one side and somebody on the other side. Because when Aaron got weak, he could say, hey, uh, her, can you kind of hold a minute till I take a rest? Can you hold both hands up? Been a lot of times in ministry I've needed somebody just to come by. I ask God to forgive me for the times if you needed me that I wasn't there. I ask you to forgive me for the times that I didn't know that you're in a battle. You put on a good smile and I didn't understand your pain. I think in this room, for the most part, I've passed by a casket for almost everybody in this room, some member of your family. And I couldn't heal you. I couldn't fix it. I couldn't take away the pain. But I could be there with you. I could speak to you God's word. Will you pray this prayer simply? Will you just pray it? Strengthen me so that I can strengthen others. Cause my dedication to my God be obvious so men will allow me to get that close, to lift their hands, to save them in the battle, to deliver them from the bondage to set them free from the snare of the devil serpent by providing the rod of ministry that I have in my hand. If you will, just lift hands for a moment, separate for a moment, just lift your own hands and say, Lord, strengthen me because I'm going to be needed this week. Strengthen me because there are some that are going to need my efforts. Strengthen me because there are those that are weakened and they need me to encourage them to bring life liberty and blessings and favor just for a moment if you will just continue to praise the lord there's 
there's strength needed in this room this morning. There's encouragement that is needed. There's provision. Transitions on the way, Kim. Stand in the strength of the Lord. Allow the encouragement to have his will and to have his way. Fight the battle, win the war, bring the strength and the victory. I thank you, Father, because today is a day of a new beginning and an awakening, a day of peace. Day when you're going to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. Sam, would you take a hold of these hands? Would you just, just kind of lift them for a moment? Command the blessing to be in your favor. And even in your transition right now, Sam, the Lord goes before you. He has not abandoned you, left you comfortless. You're too powerful as a lifter of others. Now it's your turn to be lifted and to recognize the value and the calling that's upon your life and your future for the purpose of the kingdom. So glory to God. days before we're all that's been missing all that's been hurting we look back over our shoulders just one more time and say I'm beginning again oh we're tight God right now let her know that she can not choose love to show us for us for the future that is so bright no limits nothing held back she's got a beautiful great plan The Bible says that the peace of God that passes understanding will keep our hearts and our minds. If you will. Father, I thank you for a brand new beginning right now. I thank you because these hands that maybe have felt like they needed somebody to lift her. Very soon, these hands are going to be lifting other people out of pain, giving direction, encouragement, life. So I thank you for fighting the battles and winning the wars. As Moses lifted his hand and just the waters drowned the enemy, I ask you let the water of your word drown every opposition that's come against mind, soul, and body. Release my friend to your, her future, to the purpose that you have and the strength. Sometimes we don't understand the steps. We step on it and it's a hole and not a step at all. But the Lord said, I have begun a new work in you and through you and for you. Prepare your hands to be busy lifting others while I'm lifting your hands to make possible the impossible. Permanent future. Establish and set for the kingdom of sin. Close down here. Thank you. Somebody say the battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. How many of you recognize that it's not a hard thing just to lift up your hand and say, God help me? Then we take the second step, help me to help someone else. How many realize we're not an island entire. Nobody can make it in life without others. I think about everybody in this room has had to come by and lift my hands at some time. But aren't you glad that God then enables us to reach out and pay it forward, if you will, and help somebody else in the time of need? Can we clap our hands and give God the praise that says, I believe and I trust you to make a way.
Amen. You may be seated for just a moment if you'd like. I, I pray you received this and heard in your own circumstance because we need to let people know that we are there for them. We will lift their hands and we will be an encouragement to them. I'm very blessed. Anybody blessed with me? Amen. Let's clap our hands. Give God praise one more time.